You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode number 227 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. As y'all recall in the last episode, we looked at Abraham Lincoln's decision to relieve George McClellan of command of the Army of the Potomac in early November 1862. With this show, we'll continue with the story of Little Mac's dismissal and the elevation of Ambrose Burnside to command the Army. One thing we didn't mention last time, but that we thought we'd better address, even if just briefly, was the timing of Lincoln's removal of McClellan. When the president sacked Little Mac, pretty much everyone couldn't help but notice that it took place right after the recent midterm elections. Major General George Meade, a division commander in the Army of the Potomac, wrote to his wife, explaining that had Little Mac been dismissed immediately after Antietam, quote, I could have seen some show of reason on military grounds. But, Meade continued, Little Mac getting the boot immediately after the elections, quote, proves conclusively that the cause is political. Meade wasn't alone in thinking that, but as our discussion last week showed, Abraham Lincoln's decision to remove Little Mac from command was not based on purely political reasons. Having said that, however, it must also be admitted that the timing of Lincoln's move was certainly influenced by politics. In his book, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, George Rabel writes, quote, Lincoln had solid military reasons to get rid of McClellan, but political imperatives had momentarily stayed his hand. Timing, Lincoln well knew, in both political and military affairs, was everything. So just as he had waited to replace Major General Don Carlos Buell in the Western Theater until after the October states had voted, He hesitated now to move against the popular McClellan before the New York elections. Really, Lincoln didn't want to give the Democrats an opportunity to make a martyr of McClellan. But on November 5th, once it was certain that Horatio Seymour, the Democratic candidate for governor in New York, was going to win, the president at last ordered General-in-Chief Henry Halleck to remove McClellan. So, there you go. And since it was touched on just a moment ago, we should probably go ahead and point out that in addition to replacing McClellan with Burnside in the Eastern Theater, the recent midterm elections also allowed Lincoln to make a major command change in the Western Theater. You see, a week before Little Mac got the boot, Lincoln relieved Don Carlos Buell of command of the Army of the Ohio. Buell, as a general, was cut too much from the same cloth as McClellan to suit Lincoln. As we mentioned previously on the podcast, Lincoln had been extremely frustrated with Buell after he failed to pursue Braxton Bragg's Confederate army when Bragg retreated from Kentucky back into Tennessee after the Battle of Perryville. And so once he had the chance, Lincoln replaced Buell with Major General William Rosecrans, whose stock had risen considerably after his victory at the Battle of Corinth, down in northern Mississippi. Okay, 
So a final thought here with regard to the ousters of Buell and Little Mac. But it's very important to realize that by making these major command changes in both the West and the East in the fall of 1862, Abraham Lincoln wasn't simply cleaning house for its own sake, but he was hoping, above all, by making these command changes, to see significant military victories in both theaters by the end of the year. At the end of last week's show, Brigadier General Catherine S. Buckingham had traveled from Washington through a snowstorm and arrived at Ninth Corps headquarters in the village of Orlean, Virginia, on the evening of November 7, 1862. Buckingham handed Ambrose Burnside an envelope containing General Orders No. 182, which read, By direction of the President of the United States, it is ordered that Major General McClellan be relieved of command of the Army of the Potomac and that Major General Burnside take command of the Army. Before the night that Buckingham came calling, Burnside had already turned down the offer to command the Army at least once before, and now he immediately did so again. Burnside told Buckingham that neither he nor any other general could step into McClellan's shoes and lead the Army of the Potomac. But Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, expecting this response from Burnside, had told Buckingham to use all of his powers of persuasion to get the reluctant general to accept the command this time. And so, knowing that Abraham Lincoln was set on removing Little Mac, Buckingham proceeded to do some arm-twisting. But still, Burnside refused. The previously close friendship between Burnside and McClellan had chilled after the battles at South Mountain and Antietam, since Burnside thought McClellan had denied him the credit that was due him for the victory at South Mountain, and McClellan thought Burnside had inexcusably bungled the attack on the Confederate right at Antietam. But despite all of that, Burnside, according to Buckingham, said that he, quote, did not feel competent to command and stated that he was under very great personal obligations to McClellan, end quote. You see, before the Civil War, Burnside had resigned his commission in the old army and tried to make a living manufacturing and marketing a new carbine that he'd invented but he wasn't able to sell enough of them to sustain his business. Facing financial ruin and desperate, he sought help from McClellan, who had also left the Army and was now vice president of the Illinois Central Railroad. McClellan not only got Burnside a job with the railroad, but for a time took Burnside and his wife into his home. So all of that's to say that even though relations between the two men had recently taken a turn for the worse, it was no surprise that Burnside still felt, quote, that he was under very great personal obligations to McClellan. But Buckingham now played his trump card. He told Burnside that McClellan was finished. There was no getting around that. And if Burnside refused the appointment, it would be offered to Major General Joseph Hooker. As Buckingham knew it would, that put things in a different light for Burnside, who disliked and distrusted the ambitious Hooker. Burnside discussed the matter with his staff, and then rather than see command of the army go to Hooker, he reluctantly accepted the job. Buckingham asked the new commander of the Army of the Potomac to accompany him to deliver the news to the old one. So they rode together back through the snow to Buckingham's train and took it up the line to McClellan's headquarters at Rectortown. About an hour before midnight, they arrived at McClellan's quarters and knocked on his tent pole. Little Mac was there, writing his nightly letter to his wife Nellie. He wasn't surprised to see them, despite the late hour and the weather, since he'd heard that a special train carrying someone important from Washington had arrived earlier in the day. When that person didn't come to Army headquarters, but instead left the train and rode to see Burnside, McClellan suspected what was up. Now, here were Buckingham and Burnside, both looking very solemn. By all accounts, Little Mac received the pair of generals politely, 
making small talk with them, as if visitors arriving in a snowstorm in the middle of the night were an everyday occurrence. After a few moments, though, Buckingham turned to Burnside and said, Well, General, I think we had better tell General McClellan the object of our visit. I should be glad to learn of it, McClellan said pleasantly. Buckingham then handed him the envelope with the orders from Lincoln and Halleck. After reading Lincoln's order relieving him of command, and the instructions from Halleck that he was to leave the army and travel to his home in New Jersey, McClellan turned to a miserable and mortified Burnside, and with a smile said, Well, Burnside, I turn the command over to you. The unhappy Burnside later recalled how, quote, I then assumed command, in the midst of a violent snowstorm, with the army in a position I knew but little of. I probably knew less than any other corps commander of the positions and relative strength of the several corps of the army, end quote. In fact, because he knew so little about the Army of the Potomac's dispositions, Burnside asked McClellan if he would stay for one or two days so they could discuss the Army's deployment and the military situation, and Little Mac agreed. That night, when his visitors had left, McClellan picked up his pen again and continued his letter to Nellie. As he had opened the envelope containing the orders relieving him of command, he'd noticed that Buckingham was watching him for a reaction, so he proudly told his wife, quote, I am sure that not a muscle quivered, nor was the slightest expression of feeling visible on my face, which he watched closely. They shall not have that triumph. Regarding his successor, he noted, quote, Poor Burn feels dreadfully. I am sorry for him. And then, predictably, Little Mac had only arrogant disdain for his superiors in Washington, writing, quote, They have made a great mistake. Alas, for my poor country. I know in my innermost heart she never had a truer servant. McClellan's anger and disappointment quickly surfaced. On November 9th, two days after his dismissal, he told a staff officer that death seemed preferable to leaving his army in another's hands. He voiced similar sentiments at an officer's reception that evening, telling the gathering, quote, I feel as if the Army of the Potomac belonged to me. It is mine. I feel that its officers are my brothers, its soldiers my children. This separation is like a forcible divorce of husband and wife. And that analogy actually wasn't very far off the mark, since many officers and enlisted men in the Army reacted to the news of McClellan's removal with the anguish of a jilted lover. Previously on the podcast, we've noted and remarked upon the incredible bond between Little Mac and his soldiers, which we've always found kind of fascinating since he was such a terrible, awful battlefield general. But it has to be admitted that George McClellan possessed formidable talents in other areas, and by building the Union's principal field army in the Eastern Theater, from the wreckage of green units that had lost at first bull run, he'd instilled a sense of pride in the men and gained their devotion. In a special order dated November 7th, McClellan told the Army, In parting from you, I cannot express the love and gratitude I bear to you. As an Army, you have grown up under my care. In you, I have never found doubt or coldness. The battles you have fought under my command will proudly live in our nation's history. The glory you have achieved, our mutual perils and fatigues, the graves of our comrades fallen in battle and by disease, the broken forms of those whom wounds and sickness have disabled, the strongest association which can exist among men, unite us still by an unbreakable tie. John Gibbon, McClellan's former West Point classmate, graduating a year behind him in 1847, said the army was, quote, thunderstruck by the news that their George was being taken from them again, apparently this time for good. 
Gibbon said, quote, There is but one opinion upon this subject among the troops, and that is, the government has gone mad. It is the worst possible thing that could have been done, and will be worth to the South as much as a victory. Everyone feels gloomy and sad that a man who has done so much for his country should be treated in this manner. End quote. And although there was a minority who saw McClellan's removal as a positive mood move, Gibbon's reaction was no doubt an accurate reflection of the majority of those in the Army of the Potomac, as a spasm of anger and outrage swept through the ranks. There was wild talk, particularly among McClellan's staff, of defying the President's order, marching on Washington, and taking control of the government. This wasn't a new idea. Several times in the past, as early as 1861, there had been talk of setting McClellan up in a dictatorship in the old Roman style to see the country through this time of crisis, and then, when it was safe to do so, he would lay the reins down and turn things back over to the politicians. McClellan, at times, had seemed fascinated by, by the idea, but in his book, Lincoln and McClellan, The Troubled Partnership Between a President and His General, John Waugh points out that what prevented him from ever seriously following up on this idea of dictatorship, quote, was McClellan's ultimate good sense. He was a soldier, and such disloyalty would be the supreme act of insubordination and rebellion. Not even against the administration he despised would he do that. Now, having been fired, he recognized this sentiment rising again and moved quickly to quash it. End quote. Perhaps the greatest service George McClellan ever did for the country after his accomplishment in building the Army of the Potomac in 1861 was here in November 1862 when he quashed that wild talk about overthrowing the government. James McPherson, in his book, Tried by War, Amer Abraham Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief, writes, quote, Nothing in McClellan's tenure of command became him like the leaving of it. Despite emotional pleas from some officers to defy Lincoln's order and change front on Washington, McClellan discounted such talk and turned the army over to his successor. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics. We go back to source materials in their original languages. And we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. On the day he left for good, November 11th, Little Mac would tell the Army 
I wish you to stand by Burnside as you have stood by me, and all will be well. But really, would all be well? Hmm, well, actually, probably not. Because McClellan was going to be a hard act to follow for whoever tried to step into his shoes. There's no denying George Brinton McClellan was one of the Civil War's most controversial figures, repeatedly demonstrating scorn and contempt for his civilian masters in Washington, and exhibiting, in stunning proportions, an unlovely mix of ambition, narcissism, absence of self-awareness, and lack of battlefield prowess. Sadly, for anyone attempting to follow McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac, he'd already put his stamp on the Army, compromising its performance by creating a culture of overcautiousness that persisted even after Ulysses S. Grant arrived on the scene in the spring of 1864. Overcautiousness, of course, was Lincoln's word. And speaking of Abraham Lincoln, really the war, if you read many of the letters from McClellan's pen, seemed to be a drama whose storyline mostly revolved around allowing the long-suffering hero to win the conflict despite tormentors in the Lincoln administration and in the Army's hierarchy. But Little Mac wanted to win the conflict by means of soft war, that is, a restrained war that smashed the rebellion and restored the Union, but didn't seek to destroy the slavery-based social structure of the southern states. The famous Harrison's Landing letter that McClellan handed Lincoln in July 1862 underscores this point. For McClellan the war should be waged for the sole purpose of restoring the Union, and adding emancipation to the equation would be unwise and harmful. But Abraham Lincoln had added emancipation to the equation, since the President was convinced the war could not be won without taking that measure. By the fall of 1862, Lincoln had clearly signaled that he was done trying to win the conflict by using a strategy of soft war that had been tried and had failed. And so the president, to achieve victory, was ready to let the hard hand of war in all its fury descend upon the Confederacy, while little Mac, just as clearly, was not going to let go of his ideas about waging soft war. In the end, McClellan got the axe, because he failed to defeat the rebel army to his front, and perhaps worse for the country and his own career, he had failed to understand Lincoln to his rear, who had tried for so long to be his friend and support him. Those failures, taken together, brought George McClellan down and ended his dreams of military glory. Well, Little Mac may have turned command of the army over to Burnside and then departed on November 11th and traveled to his home in New Jersey, but regrettably, that won't be the last we hear of George McClellan. He'll pop up again on the podcast in 1864 when he's the Democratic candidate in that year's presidential election running against Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, uh, so we'll have that to look forward to. But here in November 1862... At this point in our story, McClellan has just got the axe and left the army in the hands of Ambrose Burnside, who has accepted the command only reluctantly, very reluctantly. We've met Burnside before on the podcast, of course, going right back to First Bull Run. But since he's just been elevated to the starring role, so to speak, here with the Army of the Potomac, it might be a good idea to take a closer look at his life story. So, So, Ambrose Everett Burnside, with his bald dome and impressive mutton-chop whiskers, was 38 years old in November 1862 when he accepted command of the Army of the Potomac. 
born in Indiana, Burnside, who had always been interested in the military, secured an appointment to West Point and graduated 18th of 20 in the class of 1847. Commissioned a lieutenant in the artillery, he was sent to Mexico, where the shooting had stopped before his arrival in Veracruz. Burnside was assigned to Captain Braxton Bragg's battery of the 3rd Artillery, which upon its return from Mexico was stationed at Fort Adams at Newport, Rhode Island. In 1849, the battery was transferred to the New Mexico Territory, where Burnside was slightly wounded during a skirmish with Apache warriors. After a brief assignment to Jefferson Barracks at St. Louis, Burnside was part of the survey team mapping out the new U.S.-Mexican border. In 1852, he again found himself at Fort Adams in Rhode Island, where he married Mary Bishop Richmond and worked on perfecting a breech-loading carbine that he'd invented. Burnside resigned his commission in 1852 so he could devote his full time and attention to developing and marketing his carbine. Although government testing boards rated the weapon highly and Rich's old buddy, Secretary of War John Floyd, made a verbal promise to purchase large numbers of it, Floyd then was apparently bribed by a rival gunmaker and broke his agreement with Burnside. Burnside had been counting on that lucrative government contract and was hit hard financially by Floyd's duplicity. Not long afterward, Burnside's Democratic friends in Rhode Island convinced him to run for a seat in Congress in 1858, but his heart wasn't in it, and besides, he was too busy trying to save his failing business to actually campaign. He lost the election by a wide margin, and shortly thereafter, his factory burned, and his creditors took control of the patents for his carbine, of which 55,000 were produced during the Civil War, earning them a tidy profit, but Burnside not a penny. At any rate, when a desperate Burnside then went west in search of work, he eventually turned to and was hired by an old army friend who had also left the military, George McClellan. McClellan had found success working for the Illinois Central Railroad and was happy to secure a position for Burnside. By the time of the outbreak of the war in 1861, Burnside was the rail line's treasurer. With the outbreak of war, Burnside's past military experience and Rhode Island ties secured him a commission as colonel of the 1st Rhode Island Volunteer Infantry. He led a brigade at First Bull Run in July of 1861, where he performed well enough to earn a promotion to Brigadier General of Volunteers in August. He was placed in charge of the training of the new brigades that were being fit together in the Army of the Potomac under its commander, George McClellan. In the fall of 1861, McClellan saw to it that his friend Burnside was assigned to command the Coast Division, which was a newly organized three-brigade force tasked with conducting coastal operations in support of the Army of the Potomac. To that end, Burnside assembled 15,000 troops and a motley array of gunboats and transports at Annapolis, Maryland. In early January 1862, the fleet put to sea and arrived at Hatteras Inlet, North Carolina. After gaining a number of successes along the Confederacy's vulnerable Atlantic coastline, including securing Roanoke Island in February, and winning a victory at New Bern in March, Burnside was then hampered by lack of reinforcements and resources, and had to content himself with consolidating his gains and awaiting further orders. As a result of the failure of the Peninsula Campaign, Burnside and many of his troops were shipped back north to Virginia to bolster McClellan's battered force. Now promoted to Major General, Burnside was placed in command of the new Ninth Corps, which was sent to reinforce John Pope's Army of Virginia. Burnside, however, remained in Fredericksburg directing troop movements and wasn't involved in the defeat at Second Bull Run. After that, with Pope out and Little Mac back in the saddle, Burnside found himself commanding a wing of the Army of the Potomac, consisting of both his own Ninth Corps and Hooker's First Corps, 
which fought at South Mountain on September 14, 1862. But three days later, at the Battle of Antietam, McClellan sent Hooker's Corps over to the north side of the battlefield, while the Ninth Corps was positioned down to the south, essentially leaving a disgruntled Burnside to stew as a wing commander without a wing to command. As we already mentioned earlier in the episode, Burnside was already peeved because he felt McClellan had slighted him when doling out praise for the victory at South Mountain, and then McClellan, in turn, was dissatisfied with Burnside's performance at Antietam. Although relations between he and McClellan had been strained by their recent tiff, Ambrose Burnside remained in command of the Ninth Corps after Antietam, and he was leading it there in northern Virginia as part of Little Mac's belated movement against the Confederates when we picked up the thread of this story at the start of the last show, with Buckingham traveling from Washington to the Army of the Potomac with the orders removing McClellan from command and giving the army to Burnside. Depending on what accounts you consult, it appears Burnside had already been sounded out about the possibility of commanding the army or actually offered the position at least once before, perhaps twice, after McClellan's Peninsula campaign collapsed with the disaster of the Seven Days Battles, and then after John Pope had met with ruin at Second Bull Run. But each time Burnside had refused, saying that he doubted his own capabilities. This time, however, when Catherine S. Buckingham came calling on that snowy evening of November 7th, although Burnside still harbored the same doubts, and despite his misgivings about superseding McClellan, in the end, he couldn't stand the thought of the army being given to Hooker. So Ambrose Burnside reluctantly accepted the offer, and became the new commander of the Army of the Potomac. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Burnside by William Marvel. In most Civil War books, Ambrose Burnside is pictured as little better than a bumbling, incompetent dolt who somehow managed to rise to command of the Army of the Potomac. But Marvel's sympathetic biography of Burnside challenges that traditional viewpoint. It's a good read, although I have to say uh, it, or at least the paperback edition that we have, has hands down the most hideous cover of any book in our Civil War library. But I guess that really doesn't matter unless, you know, we were giving out an award for worst book cover. Okay. So anyway, that's Burnside by William Marvel. You can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then we have a request to make, and it's that if you listen to the podcast on iTunes and enjoy it, please consider taking a minute or two to give it a five-star rating or even writing a quick review saying how much you enjoy it because... Because that helps other people discover the podcast on iTunes. Uh, yep, and if you listen to the podcast and don't enjoy it, well, then just keep that to yourself. <laughs> Okay, Rich. All right. Uh, then as we wrap things up, a big thank you to the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade, Pat, Paul, Lee, and Mark. And a special thank you to David L. for his donation to the podcast this past week. We've already put that toward picking up some back issues of Gettysburg Magazine for our research on the battle. Yep. Uh, we like to try and stay pretty far ahead with reading and research. And we mentioned on a recent Facebook post that we started in on the reading and research for the Gettysburg story arc. And so we're trying to round up some back issues of that magazine that we don't have. So we really appreciate the financial support of the members of the Strawfoot Brigade and also folks who make donations like David, which helps us do stuff like that. And that's about it for this show. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. 
Rich and I do hope you join us again next time when we look at the pressure on Burnside to immediately move against the rebels. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. it's time for this episode's book recommendation and our recommendation this time is Burnside <laughs> sorry yep uh, we like to try and stay pretty far ahead with reading and research and we mentioned on a recent Facebook post that we started in on the reading and research for the Gettysburg story arc and so we're trying to round up some back issues of that magazine that we don't have and for those of you that are bidding against us on eBay Curse you, a pox upon your household. Rich. Just, just kidding. Kind of. Rich. Uh, sorry, talking about John Floyd <laughs> earlier in the episode is just got me all wound up. Sorry, sorry, sorry.